We were our own entity, and uh, we were very proud of that when we had our big sister network to the north over the Alps. Two announcers. In 1967, SEN would make its final move to its current home at Caserma Ederly. It was essential that we have this television network of the armed forces in Italy, and by gosh, we have it. This is your American Expeditionary Station in the field with the Fifth Army, a radio service for American fighting men and their allies. American military broadcasting in Southern Europe began with the Fifth Army at the end of the Second World War. A two and a half ton truck packed with records and equipment served as a mobile radio station that followed the troops from Verona, Italy into Austria. The surge of Allied troops stopped in Vienna on the banks of the Danube River. And it was here that the broadcasters found their first home. This is the Blue Danube Network. The Blue Danube Network got its name by General Clark, Mark W. Clark, who used to be the CG of Fifth Army. And uh, he came in, he said, it's not a case of I don't want anything with AFM, but I want my own network, and we're going to call it the Blue Danube Network. And so he named it. Well, AFN stations in general had better equipment than we had. And they, a lot of them um, used non-appropriated funds to buy equipment, uh, a combination, a mix of appropriated funds and non-appropriated funds, which let you buy more equipment. But when I went to Austria, they were using uh, communications 22Ds for consoles. And this control panel had four channels on it. Five, actually, one was for the, for the volume, and then they had four pots with a, with, a, with a meter, and these four pots, one was for my microphone, one for the control room, and two for two turntables, and of course we had the little 12-inch uh, records at that time, and then came the 16 inches. No tape, we, the, only, the only thing that we had that we could record, we recorded on, on record, we'd get blank records, and we had a cutting lathe. You know, that cuts the discs slowly, and they were pretty old, and we tried doing that. And hey, yeah, it didn't work. It didn't work at all, because the guy would come on and said, in Washington today, 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 and uh, just stuck in the groove all the time. We thought it was the greatest thing since they had Coca-Cola, I guess. The, Vietnam, United States forces enough. the Blue Danube network was on the air in Vienna, Salzburg, and Linz for 10 years. When U.S. forces left Austria in 1955, they dismantled the stations and transferred the equipment to Camp Darby in Livorno, Italy. They came up, and this was in September, going September, October, and they said, that's it. We had our last broadcast. We wished everybody goodbye. And an engineer and I pulled the plug. I got in my car with my wife, and we drove to Italy. That was the end of the Blue Danger Network, and people cried. People really cried that this radio network went off the air. In Livorno, they joined the newly formed Southern European Task Force as part of the Public Affairs Office and created a new network, the Southern European Network. The command was activated on the 25 October, until then, we were really United States forces in Austria who had come to Italy. Now remember, uh, in the status of forces agreement between the Italian government and the Americans, there was no provision for broadcasting to the forces. There was a strong communist party in Italy then. said, ah, radio, what are you going to try to do with propaganda? They would not let us radiate because Dr. Principi, who was the head of Rai, said, no, we can't let you radiate uh, because if we do, we have to let other stations radiate too that we don't want on the air. So we ended up with a broadcast line from our studio to the officer club, to the EM club, to the officer mess and the EM mess. We had a, uh, a team that was negotiating with the Italians, uh, Dr. Principe at the telecommunications office in Rome. Uh, they would go down periodically and, and try to get permission to go on the air. And we had to explain that it really was a command information program. It was something that we needed to keep our own people informed of command activities and maybe what was going we're on at SCM home. And we're in your service. The stay at Camp Darby would be temporary. CTAF headquarters moved to Verona to join the NATO command and the network moved with them. 
first to an old shoe factory and then to the headquarters at Caserma Pasolacqua. But the change in address had no effect on their ability to broadcast. We didn't radiate. We didn't send signals out into the air. We were, in effect, in those early days at Caserma Pasolacqua in Verona. Uh, we were a giant sound system, basically. Our signal went through the wiring in the, in the barracks and in the housing area and so forth. We were feeding other sites, but they were picking us up and broadcasting us close circuit. Yeah, we sent it down by telephone line. Of course, the bandwidth on a telephone line, <laughs> it sounded like it was coming from a telephone, too. We were called a network, I think largely because we hoped that we eventually we would go on the air and then we would be a network. But, well, we just constantly tried to expand getting the broadcasting to different areas, and that, that's what our network operations were really all about. From the AP about. and UPI, this is SEN's World News Roundup. We got the news and sports off the wire service out of Rome, but for broadcast, we were getting broadcast off of uh, Voice of America in uh, Northern Africa. We got newspaper copy coming in on some teletype machine that offered a lot of garble. We had little garble guides so we could translate the, uh, the garble when the, the case jumped on the machines. And when atmospherics were bad, we couldn't read the news. And we would tune in these, these teletype signals and uh, lock them in. We'd write a whole five-minute newscast, go on the air and read it, then go back into the newsroom and rewrite the whole thing, maybe from the same newspaper copy, but taking a different angle, you know. President Kennedy, on a visit in Dallas, Texas, has been reportedly seriously wounded, perhaps fatally. Well, the assassination of the president was, was really a, a big deal because we were still closed circuit at that time, which meant that no one off the base heard what was happening. And I got a phone call at my home. I lived very close to the base, and it was from uh, an Italian friend who said he had heard this, and I jumped in the car, went into the station, and I was there when the, when the teletype printed out the flash Kennedy did. The president was 46 years old. He had been two years, 10 months, and two days in his high office. We immediately got on the phone, started calling people, and of course, the word spread all over the city. And Americans who were unable to get any American broadcast streamed onto the base, and many of them came into the station. And the station was full of people, tuxedos, uh, shorts, every conceivable kind of attire because they came from parties and wherever they were uh, to get the news. We got the uh, CTAP dispatch staff and uh, we gave them AP copy off the teletype and they printed up huge flyers that said the president is dead. And those were given to the military police at the main gate and as people came on they were handed this information so that we we did our best to get the information to people, but that was the big deal for us, is trying to get the information to an audience that was unable to hear the broadcasts. Good morning, Vietnam! One of the ways that the Vietnam War affected us uh, for, from a broadcasting standpoint in Italy is that most of our good broadcasters were serving out of Saigon with AFV and the Armed Forces Vietnamese Network. and. Uh, we just couldn't wait for that war to be over so we could get good broadcasters coming, cycling through again. The last American to be killed in, in Vietnam when the war ended was a lieutenant colonel named Bill Nolte, who was at one time the commander a couple of years earlier, the commander of the artillery bat battalion, the second of the 30th artillery in Vicenza. And, uh, when that story hit the wires, you know, it was a local story, really. I was at the station, and I put it on the air, and uh, before long, we had some, some guys from the battalion over at the station, you know, wondering what happened. They got the news from us. Nobody else got it to them. Back. That story and others just seconds away on SEN News. While the network was still trying to get a signal over the air, the Army was consolidating. In 1967, CTAF moved to its new headquarters at Caserma Ederly in Vicenza. It was getting to be too expensive a proposition, really, to have a command with the troops in Vicenza, 
the G staff and the commanding general at a short distance, but nevertheless in a different town. They moved first, actually. We were still broadcasting from there while uh, the headquarters was here. And uh, nobody was left in Verona except for the MPs, uh, the radio station, and uh, the officers club was still open, and they still had a movie theater. We, we basically built two facilities. We took the old facility, moved what we had, that we had to have in the new facility in Vicenza, and moved it down the autostrada to, to Vicenza, from Verona to Vicenza, and put it in place. And then one night, in the middle of the night, we just threw the switch. So, uh, but we were still, in large part, closed circuit. Uh, I saw what was happening in the negotiations with the Italian government to get permission to broadcast, because you can't broadcast unless you have Called him. And uh, he had an assistant named Ettore Antonini. And Franco and Ettore used to get us together and figure out how or in the world are we going to put this station on the air. So our chief engineer, Frank Harris, took some old phonograph records, took the shellac off of them, or, or the vinyl off of them, and using the metal, he folded and bent and put holes in there and he fabricated a transmitter about the size of a bread box. Wire coils around a, a cereal box, and uh, we took crystals, you know, broadcasting crystals, and ground them with talcum powder down to a point where we could actually put this transmitter on the air. And we took that transmitter and put it on top of the filing cabinet in the newspaper office. We loaded up a drain pipe. We used the drain pipe on the edge of the building as an antenna just to see if it would work. And that was our first 51 antenna. And we were able to pick it up. Oh, well, today it's going to be nice. Nice with music and nice with the weather, fair to partly cloudy skies. So let's enjoy it, all right? Let's get a place in the sun. Within an hour after that transmitter went on the air, I got a phone call from a friend of mine saying, I can pick up your signal. It's great. But you guys really have to change your programming. All that terrible rock and roll, you've got to get rid of that. Well, we realized that we were suddenly broadcasting to a larger audience of, of dependents, of children, and we had to uh, provide more information about local activities. Uh, we had to provide more of a variety of music because there were more people out there who wanted classical music and so forth. So, we did have to change our programming. The American listeners weren't the only ones concerned. Within a few weeks, the Italians were paying attention to the broadcasts as well. If you remember, at that time, the Communist Party was very, very powerful in Italy. The Partito Comunista complained. They complained to the U.S. Embassy, and they complained to the PTT and RAI that we were on the air and they wouldn't. They wouldn't let them put a station on the air. We were on the air, but they weren't. So the ambassador to Italy asked that we go off the air. That protest originally shut us down for about a week. We had to stop all broadcast operations. So we went off the air, but we had a producer, a young, a young uh, sergeant there, who decided he was going to go, when we go off the air, you're going to know it. So he took the Mormon Tabernacle Choir, the Philadelphia Symphony Orchestra, and every other version of the Star Spangled Banner that he could find, and he laced them all together with the sounds of jets and the sounds of uh, cannon firing and so forth, and produced about a 10-minute version of the Star Spangled Banner. 
and we faded to black, to use a television term. And shortly thereafter, we got permission to go on the air. With a signal on the air, the network again expanded. In 1974, the Department of Defense put the Army in charge of American Forces Radio Services in Italy, and SCN took operational control of broadcasting from Aviano to Siganella. There to partly cloudy for Vicenza, Verona, and Getty, and Lake Garda, and Aviano in the northern Adriatic Beach. Some morning haze throughout the area for the Livorno Camp Derby Pease area and for the Naples, Naples Bay area. Fair skies. Well, the Defense Department decided that there were going to be operational controls given to different services in different countries. And because the Army was given control of radio and TV in Italy, we became the the source, the controlling source for all of the broadcasting in that country. A lot of it had to do with the, the supply of material, uh, you know, the, the equipment we needed and everything. It was easier to send it to Vicenza and then for uh, Vicenza to distribute it to the affiliate stations, the AFN affiliates within Italy. And as the network increased, so did broadcasting. In 1976, television came to American bases in Italy, and the Southern European Network greeted viewers with the first color broadcast in AFRTS. TV first began in Vicenza on September 13, 1976. That's the day we signed on. And uh, again, of course, it was closed circuit. But uh, we had, a, we had a big ceremony, and uh, we signed on. The dynamic mission of adding uh, television to radio uh, probably tripled, quadrupled our workforce in Vicenza and, of course, all of the affiliates uh, around Italy as well increased personnel. Our audience became bigger and the mission became more complex, more exciting. The larger audience brought another change to the network. We had the SEN name, you know, it was Southern European Network. Then there was some political problem, we had to change it, so the general in Vicenza said it would be Southern European Broadcasting, or SEB. We had to come up with a plan, figure out a name, and within a week change all of our jingles, our station IDs, and we went from the Southern European Network to Southern European Broadcasting. We still were a network, but in the eyes of the Italians, we were not. When I first got here, SCB was part of CTAF. And um, shortly thereafter, it broke away from CTAF, fell into USERA. About two years later, fell in, broke away from USERA and fell under a newly formed unit command called Army Broadcast Services. It was a, a uh, operating command that reported directly to Army Broadcasting Service. While Army Broadcasting managed the people and equipment, Southern European Broadcasting still functioned as a network in the AFRTS family, broadcasting to audiences throughout Italy. This has been SEB's Evening Update, a presentation of SEB News. We would sign on about 10 o'clock in the morning and sign off about midnight and go to color bars. And it was a closed circuit. We received um, weekly shipments of um, tapes from, at that time, it was uh, Armed Forces Radio and Television Service in California. Big blue tapes and boxes that were running on a circuit throughout uh, Europe. So we would get a box of tapes, uh, play that week's worth of programming, box the tape up and send it to another station and it went that way. That was uh, really a challenging time for us because oftentimes the tapes would not arrive on time or they would arrive out of sequence. And you know, some people would air the wrong reel first and so we had to do a lot of explaining to the audience why they were seeing a particular episode of their favorite soap opera or sitcom or uh, entertainment program uh, out of sequence. You have to try to call the station and get whoever was on duty to go back and start the program again. The audience was, was very understanding and um, in those days uh, we were primarily the only service that our audience had the opportunity to see. So. Reports on that. Coming up on News Center 3, uh, <laughs> pictures from Voyager and some of the problems with Voyager and Pan Am, a progress report from the automakers and the sites, the sounds, and our the Our anchors would do a live newscast using 
old news that's maybe a week old, because they were trying to get the tapes to us as fast as possible from the States. That we would uh, use those stories along with local stuff that we shot here in the community and make a big kind of national, local newscast out of that. Today's sports highlights. My turn already? Yes. Okay. The Rams win last night thanks to Eric Dickerson. Nebraska is still number one in the AP College football poll and locally CTAF flag football. Flag football highlights. We were actually That's using right uh, a mix of uh, umatic formats and one inch formats. We were producing the newscast on a one inch format and uh, doing it live to tape with, uh, with a crew of about six or seven people. We had two anchors. We also had a, a weather person for a long time, which when I think about it now, it's really kind of funny because all the funny stories I remember about AFN Vicenza back in those days revolved around the weather. Temperature's a little strange. I think we'll ignore that. Something's wrong there. Humidity is about 48%. The winds are not doing anything, but neither was the temperature. I'm really worried about our... Uh, there we go. My news guys was the way to go because it gets the pump, gets the heart pumping, the blood flowing. Today, police say that two gunmen on a motorcycle shot and wounded a prominent banker outside his... Excuse me, outside his Milan home today. A bank guard reportedly shot and killed the attackers. Police say the dud gunman has a record for petty crimes. Incidentally, I was not wounded by that light bulb. Job well, security fact, is tight in the He got burned pretty good because the light bulb exploded, went down the collar of his neck, and uh, he got some pretty good burns. But he hung his ground like a good broadcaster, did his newscast, and then took care of his wounds. It was, it was a production every evening, you know, and sometimes uh, it was tense and sometimes it was fun. They gave me tremendous freedom as you can have to that degree while working in an armed forces radio station. There was a wonderful spirit and a wonderful passion among the broadcasters there. Those old days in radio, uh, working with the bare minimum, are uh, the most memorable, memorable times for me. We put television on, we put radio on, we put FM stereo on, uh, we put transmitters and sites all over Italy. Never once thought that that was anything historic. It was just something you did. 